Good morning, Whitewater. Good morning. And I want to add my thank you to all the veterans and uh, family members who have veterans. Um, we're so grateful for your service and sacrifice. Uh, I'm grateful to be part of this church. I'm 36 years old now, uh, one of the pastors here. I have a wife named Sarah, a beautiful blonde gal. And uh, I've got two little kids. I've got a one-year-old uh, son named Wes, and I've got a five-year-old, uh, soon-to-be six-year-old uh, little novella. And uh, we were hanging out um, because this is the season of life that we're in. I love it. Love being a dad. And um, we were hanging out in, in Novella's room playing, and, and Wes was throwing slash playing with things, and tr- he trundles around. Um, uh, she it trundles and stomps, and she walks around, and she's playing and singing, and and all of a sudden it becomes apparent that, um, that Wes is in need of a diaper change. And uh, Novella got this look and she's just like, oh, dad. She's like, ah. Uh, when, it, when Wes is that bad, uh, y- you know that he has diabetes. <laughs> I said, you know your grandpa has diabetes. She's like, oh, he does sometimes. Um, <laughs> Love, love the season of life that uh, we're in. Uh, maybe some of you families can uh, sympathize. So uh, we've been in this series called We Bless, and um, we've really been, been focusing on three areas. A, a strategy that Jesus lays out in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where he, where he says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And, and it really is a, is a strategy where we say, hey, we want to be a people of blessing. You and I are blessed to become a blessing. No matter what your experience is, no matter what your background is, God has given you skills and experiences and, and gifts to become a blessing. And so we want to we wanna have personal blessing, like our Jerusalem. Jesus says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That, that's your personal circles of influence. We want to have personal blessing. Um, Judea and Samaria are like the region. We want to have a local Local, regional uh, blessing as a church, and and then we want to have a global blessing, which is to the ends of the earth. Um, and uh, as we've been talking about that, we've really identified as a church, we've and church leadership, we've identified eight deserts that we feel God calling us to bring eight rivers to. Do you guys remember hearing me talk about this the last two weeks? Laid out the vision. The incredible thing is we already have rivers that are flowing into those deserts. We already have people who are blessing and serving and meeting local needs. And, and we've been talking about uh, local blessing. Uh, that's kind of where we're at in, in, in the journey of the series. We'll be talking about global in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but locally, it's just amazing some of the things that, are, that our church is involved with. It just blows me away. And I saw people, when I first talked about the eight deserts, get really excited because I think they thought I was talking about eight desserts that we had identified in Pierce County. They're like, oh, yeah, sweet pie and chocolate. And, you know, and then they found out, oh, yeah, he, he's talking about meeting needs. That's cool, too. Um, but I am blown away by the things that are going on in our church. We actually have a, a gal in our church named Jory who is serving um, uh, people who are uh, vulnerable, like a vulnerable people group, uh, and sometimes just in cycles of poverty. And uh, it's incredible um, the, the work she, that she does. And the girls that she works with are incredible. It's, just, it's amazing. And I want you guys just to watch this video just to give you a, a taste of what's already going on in our church. This is Jory, and you're involved with some really cool stuff locally where you're, you're blessing people um, in amazing ways. Why don't you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I work for a nonprofit organization called New Beginnings Home. We're through uh, Youth of the Mission, and I work um, with at-risk single pregnant moms, and also um, after they have baby, uh, we work with them as single parents and train them how to do that, but also if they choose to place for adoption, we walk through all of that as well. So, um, and just to dig a little bit more, what, what does that look like when you're walking someone from the time they walk through the doors to even maybe when they leave? Just maybe a little snapshot of that. Yeah, so we have a maternity house where they come when they're pregnant and they'll live there until baby is born. And then after baby is born, if they choose to parent or continue with our program, they'll apply for our single moms program and they'll be in there and they can be there um, up to a year with baby. And we just train them how it looks like to be a single mom and get a job or go back to school or anything that that entails and just how to figure out how to handle a baby. And then um, if they choose to place, we walk through that. So with grief counseling, with um, working with the lady that does all of our adoptions for us and choosing a family and all that and just getting back on their feet and learning how to be independent after placing baby. 
That's amazing. Um, wh where did you get this passion? Um, I have a great family and they're a great support system and they've walked through um, a lot of stuff with me through thick and thin and um, a lot of the girls that come to us just don't have that support system or family and to be able to be a part of a ministry that is a family and that support system um, but also a lot of these girls don't have an identity or don't know their identity and um, I know that really well I walked through that situation uh, through middle school and high school and not knowing who I was so to be able to uh, help these girls walk through this uh, process of you know learning who they are and um, the best part is teaching them their identity through Christ. That's incredible. Um, and I can't wait to hear more. We're going to continue digging into the stories of how people in our church are blessing their community. But I just want to thank you for all that you do. Yeah. Isn't that awesome, you guys? Can we give Jory a hand and what she's doing? We have a group, or two, a group or two that are actually serving those areas. A lot of our local blessing uh, is, is, in, is empowered through groups and, and individuals, but we try to connect a group with an with a area of blessing, and it's just so amazing to see our church have a heart for that and see the talent that's in the, right in the middle of our church. And so um, we, we've been laying out this big vision you got the last two weeks, a big vision of, of how we bless locally. And uh, I don't know about, about you, but when I look at Big Vision, I get really excited, and, and then I look at the reality of where we are and you know, wh how we can live into that. I'm like, wow, this is a little overwhelming. Uh, do any of you guys ever feel that way? Like, well, how do we actually do this? How can we accomplish this? Like, with my life and my skill set and the time constraints and life constraints and all that stuff, how do we do this? And I, I, I wanted to kind of slow the gears down after talking kind of a bigger vision I feel God is calling us to as a church and clarifying for us as a church. I want to, I want to kind of gear down and, I, and I, wanted, I want to take time to talk about how we actually have the strength and power to do this. And the reality is that our church cannot do this on its own. You and I cannot do this in our own strength, in our own power. Um, in Isaiah 44, 3, it says this, God says this, For I will pour out water on a thirsty land and streams on the dry ground, pour rivers into a desert. And then he goes on to explain, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. And it becomes clear that the water is the blessing of the spirit. That we can't do anything on our own. John 15 says, apart from me, says Jesus, you can do nothing. We, we have to have the Spirit of God. We have to be a Spirit-empowered church, Spirit-empowered people to be able to do any of these things. For Jory, people like Jory that are blessing and they're working hard and they're, and they're living their lives for Jesus, they have to, they have, to, to have the long-haul persistence you need to cut through the rock and cut through the desert you have to be filled with the Spirit. You have to be empowered by the Spirit. And so today, I want to talk to you guys about like the most important catalytic element in any movement of God, and it's the Spirit of God. And this week was like one of the like driest, toughest weeks I've had in a while. And as I'm studying this, I'm like, man, God, I need this. This is so good for me. So like some of this is preaching to myself, um, and, and then some of it's too... Man, talking about the Spirit's hard. Like, how do you talk about smoke that's really powerful? How do you talk about the Holy Ghost? How do you talk about something that's so amazing and, and transcendent and mysterious? How do you take that and make it concrete, make it so that we can understand, fit it in our brains a little bit without dumbing it down, without diminishing it? And, but it's something that raises the level of our church. And it, it's been a really ch big challenge for me this week. But the, the, the most beautiful thing, the lucky thing I have is that Jesus is the one who really talks about this and the scriptures teach us about this. So I want to talk about the Spirit we can't do any of these things. We can't be a blessing, a river of blessing to our community. We can't get into those, those eight deserts without the empowerment of the Spirit. We see this in places like Zechariah 4. It says, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, 
says the Lord Almighty. It's not by our strength. It's not by our power. It's not by our knowledge. It's not by our abilities. It's by the power of the Spirit. We always have to remember that. Even Jesus, when he was doing ministry, didn't live within his own strength. And he, he actually lived by the power of the Spirit. He was an example for us. In, in Luke 4, uh, verse uh, 14 from chapter 4, it says, Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread. Uh, Later on in in chapter 4 of of Luke, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Jesus said, The Spirit of God is on me. Because He has anointed me to preach good news. Jesus did everything, every miracle, every moment. that You see Him changing and doing catalytic things. It was in the power of the Spirit. So easy for us to forget that. So easy for me to forget that. So how do we live Spirit-empowered lives in our limitations and the life that we live right here on earth, in our personalities, in in the flesh? How do we live Spirit-empowered lives? And how do we live as a Spirit-empowered church? Luckily, Jesus has a conversation that I think it sheds so much light onto the movement and power of the Spirit. If you have your Bibles, we're a Bible-believing church. We, we find this, the Scriptures sacred. So if you have your Bible, you go ahead and open up to John chapter 3, or you can follow up on the screen behind me. And I'll just trust that you're not watching football or something like that. I'll trust that you just got your apps out, reading your Bible app today. Um, it says this in verse 1 of chapter 3. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, stopping there for a moment to give context to this conversation. And Jesus has been doing miraculous, amazing things, Jesus things, in the power of the Spirit. And there's a sect, a, a religious leadership group at that time called the Pharisees, and they were the ones in power. They were the ones who were the religious leaders. They were the spiritual leaders, the spiritual center of that community in that day and age. And they were the ones who taught and were in the synagogues. And, um, and then Jesus comes along and begins threatening the spiritual center, their power, their uh, control, and, and a lot of their, their assumptions about spirituality. And, and this man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, it says this man came out to him at night. Stopping there again. What does it say? What does it tell us about him that he would come and see Jesus at night no that's not what it (laughs) it tells us that Jesus was living in such a way that was making an impression that he was starting he was starting to seek Jesus and be interested in the way of Jesus but because he had built his life uh, as a Pharisee and he was part of the Pharisees and they were in that at that time completely against Jesus except there were some underneath that were beginning to be interested in seeing God at work and being like hey maybe we should start investigating this a little bit more so there was some division there but on the surface they, the Pharisees policy was we are against Jesus we can't follow him it's threatening their power it threatens the the spiritual center of the community and their teachings and what they thought was important and uh and they were threatened so he went at night because he's interested but he didn't want to declare publicly his interest does that make sense and so he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. He says, like on the surface, we might publicly not acknowledge you. But underneath, like in our heart of hearts, we Pharisees, we know that there's something special about you. That, that you must come from God for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with them. I love that. No one could perform any of the signs unless God were with them. Unless, you know, God's power and presence were with him. He's too, they're too afraid to admit it publicly. And a, a little caveat, as we get into the spiritual conversation, from here on out, like Jesus is giving the teaching on, on something mysterious and deep and incredible. And, and even when Jesus is teaching it, he gives images and metaphors because the Spirit of God is like this and it's like that and it's like this. It's not exactly, and, and it's hard because when Jesus talks about spiritual things, when the Bible talks about spiritual things, we want it to be like, fully concrete and like you know scientific and a formula and we can just fully get it and and make it really easy but the hard thing about the spirit the hard thing about the the spiritual things and God himself is that if we could fit him in our brain if we could fully comprehend him he wouldn't really be God would he if we could fully comprehend everything about an incomprehensible God like that would make mean that we're God because we fully understand and it fits here and God doesn't just fit in my brain. It's like an ant trying to understand uh, the human world or something. It just, 
That's not how it works. And my mom, I was talking to her about, how do you understand spiritual things in the spirit? And she's like, man, I just loved your father at his ordination. That's like the ceremony where pastors become pastors. And she said, the first thing he started with was, I want to start this off is that we are, we are talking about comprehending the incomprehensible God. And there's just something amazing. And at the front end, I just want to say, look, at I can't explain it down to a T. When even when you read the authors from Scripture, they struggle getting it fully figured. But I want to present to you the mystery and the power of the Spirit. And it really is in this conversation that Jesus has. So I'm going to be breaking it down into three images. The images are this, water, wind, and rivers. Water, wind, and rivers. The first one is water. A spirit-immersed life. You might want to take your notes out if you have them. A spirit-immersed life. Verse 3, Jesus replies to um, Nicodemus. He says, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. Verse 4, Well, how can anybody be born when he's old? Nicodemus asks, Can he enter uh, his mother's womb a second time and be born? You can sense the frustration. Like, what are you talking about? Jesus is kind of going into his full Jedi mode, giving these uh, metaphors that he can't understand. Just tell it to me plain. Like, can, a, can someone go back and be born again in the womb? I don't think so, Jesus. And, and Jesus again answers, Truly, I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Does that make sense to you? Single. Everyone's like, oh, that makes complete sense. I'm good. <laughs> Understand it fully now. In verse 7, he says, Do not be amazed that I that I told you that you must be born again. You shouldn't be amazed by this. He's like, you should, you, should, you should know this if you're a spiritual leader. Truly, I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Water, spirit immersed. What he's talking about is, is when he talks about water, we're baptized in water. Those who would begin following Jesus are baptized, and it's the symbol of an immersed life. A life that's immersed in the power of the Spirit. That there's something fundamental that has been changed within them and around them and in their life. And in the, in the, in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 28, Jesus, Jesus says this, I've been given all authority on heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of what? Father, Son, Spirit. You are, you are entering and being immersed in the God life. And that's where it all starts. And Jesus is saying here, like it all starts with that water. It all starts with the immersion, being immersed in the spirit of God. It it starts there. And I I love that image. In Romans 8, uh, 15, it says this. So you've not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave. Instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own Children, I love that the Spirit is, is something that we receive. It's something that we open our hearts to. We open our lives to. We have to have an openness to the Spirit of God. We have to say, God, I want you. And the Spirit doesn't go where he's unwanted. He might hang out and, and try to woo us, but he's not going to force us. God goes where he's welcomed, and we have to receive him. And, and in this, it says, instead of being a slave or seeing ourselves like that, instead you receive God's Spirit when he adopted you as his children. That you and I are the sons and daughters of God. When we open ourselves up and say, God, come into my life. The Spirit, it, we're immersed in the Spirit. And, I, and I think of it like the, it's the adoption process. We become sons and daughters of God. And let me ask you this. If you have any kids, sons or daughters, if you have any adopted kids, sons or daughters, or you are a son or daughter, if you are a parent, what could your kid do that would make you not their parent anymore? That would erase the parentage nothing if something got between you and kids you and your kids what what would you do to get them back whether it's drugs some kind of addiction whether it's some kind of foolish uh, mistake or, or or something just happens in their life and there's illness what would keep you from your kids if you're a parent who has an ounce of love and nothing would you would keep you from them 
And so it is with God. Like when we are immersed in the God love life, we are adopted. We are become his sons and daughters. Something fundamentally changes. The theological term for it, if you're interested, is called regeneration. It's like the new life enters us. And we have a new heart and a new mind and new life. We have new desires. And, and we don't want to do the old things, the old dumb things. We want to do the new things. I've even had new Christians come up to me like, I don't think I'm a Christian, Pastor. I'm like, why don't you think I'm a Christian? Well, because like I, I do th- these old things that, my, that I used to do and I have these old desires and I get so frustrated and I'm, I'm so down on myself. I'm like depressed and I don't think I'm a Christian. I'm like, okay, did you used to feel bad about doing those things? No. Did you used to feel bad about that addiction? Did you used to feel bad about this? Not, not being able to, to solve this issue in your life? No, I, f- I didn't think about it at all. I'm like, because you're a Christian. Because you're adopted. Because there's new life in you. You have new desires. Like your frustration, your angst is proof that the Spirit of God is at work in your life. Amen? And the beautiful thing about water, having a spirit-immersed life, is receiving God's spirit is a one-time deal. It's not like an over and over. Like when you are immersed in the spirit, it's a, it's a regenerative thing. Your heart's regenerated. It doesn't have to happen again. It's not like you have to be readopted into the family of God. You are, you are his children. And you are fundamentally different, even if you don't feel it. He's your dad. Isn't that incredible? Can't shake him if you want it. If you try to get away from him, he'll follow you. And, uh, and I, that, that, that image is so important. I, I think of it almost like a seed that's been planted in the ground and it's dead until water seeps into the ground. And in the muck and the dirtiness of life, life springs, life comes. That's being immersed in the Spirit of God. And I, I don't want to move beyond this point. If, is there anybody perhaps in this room that's maybe been resisting or maybe been exploring faith and they're like well what does it take to be a Christian what do, what, what do I have to do you don't have to do anything you have to receive what can only be given freely and it's a life immersed in God and it starts with God's spirit coming and freeing you and forgiving you because of what Jesus did so if you would like that today, I just want to take a moment to pause. I normally don't do this, but in the middle of my sermon and give you an opportunity to, to ask for God, to immerse you, to give you new life, the God life. So if you would, would you just bow your head and if you want to take a step of faith today and you want the Spirit of God and you want to, eternal life, would you pray this prayer? Fa- Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to forgive me of all my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me and to to give me his spirit. I want to be immersed in the God life. God, would you change my life right now? Would you would you regenerate my heart? I ask this in Jesus name. Amen. If that was you, you took a step of faith and you're his son, you're his daughter. It's that simple. You just receive him. It's not more complex than that. We like to make things complex. Have you noticed that? Religious people like to do that. Jesus makes it so simple. I love, he continues, Jesus, talking about the Spirit because it doesn't stop with immersion into the Spirit. There's, there's more and wind. This is what we're talking about, wind, being Spirit-led, becoming Spirit-led. In verse 8, it says this, the wind blows where it pleases. And you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. But it, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And in verse 9 it says, how can these things be? Asked Nicodemus. You can sense the frustration building up. Like, quit talking Jedi with me, Jesus. Like, just tell me straight. And then Jesus responds to his question. Like, how can this be? Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Are you a spiritual leader and you don't know the Spirit? Are you the le- a leader of, uh, of spirituality and you don't have the Spirit of God in you? It's like a musician who can't hear the music. It's like uh, y- you know, a-, a-, a driver who's got no car. One time I was, uh, f- I was about 15 or 16 and I made it into the jazz band. I was a drummer and I, I drum at church and I had to like learn how to read music. I'd always learn to play by ear and 
we played and played and played and and finally it was the day of the concert and we had the whole band out and um all these people from our school and it was i think it was like maybe even a competition there were just all these people out there and i was the second chair because i was kind of learning and and uh my my band teacher was like hey you play these next two songs i was like all right so i jumped in the whole band's there it was just incredible and the band's like da 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 you know like really really good jazz and it goes ba da 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 bam and i'm supposed to go and I like looked out, and that was my mistake. And I like froze. I, I did not know what to do. I was like overwhelmed in the situation, and, and I don't know what. It never happened before. It never happened after. And all of a sudden, I was like, I I could not find. I was a drummer, and I could not find the beat. And there were like horn players that were like, you know, like trumpet, like looking over at me. The band teacher's like, no, he's like trying to beat it into me. And and all these people are watching. I just like froze and I can't find the beat. It was so humiliating. And the band director was like, you know, he kind of had that. It's okay. It's okay. Just like, you know, and uh, I have actually have some musicians here. They're just like probably in pain hearing this. And, uh, and, and and he had that look like, ah, it's everything's okay, but you'll never play here again. You know, it was just, and I think it's, there's part of Jesus that's looking at Nicodemus, and he's come at night, and which is great that he's interested, but he's afraid to declare his interest in seeking of Jesus in the daylight, and, and, and he doesn't understand spiritual things, and he's a spiritual leader, and he, 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 he's supposed to play the drums, but he can't find the beat. And I, I think there's many leaders out there that, that they, they, they don't hear the music of the kingdom. They don't have the spirit of God like as a friend and as something that leads their life. And, and what um, Nicodemus is, is revealing here, I think is so, so important is that he, uh, he can't see the work of the spirit. Jesus says, the wind blows where it pleases and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes or where it goes. You can see the effects of the wind. And so it is with the spirit. So it is with people filled with the Spirit. They're led here and they're led there. And God's work is going on here and there. You can't see it. You can see, only see its effects. And uh, Nicodemus is like, are you kidding me? And many of us have been, uh, I, I think, can be sitting there like Nicodemus. And we've been taught like a faith that's very static. It's like a once and for all, like, okay, I believe and I, and I'm, I go to church and so I'm in. I'm in. And that's it. And so if I do some good things and kind of do some maintenance, spiritual maintenance, you know, pray, go to church, and, but I'm in, I'm with these people, and I'm a Christian, so I have to have that, whatever political persuasion that, you, that sh- should go with your view of what Christians should think, and I have all those things in line, and that's what the, a life of faith is. That's not a life of faith in the Spirit that Jesus describes, His Life of faith, by, led by the Spirit, is dynamic, not static. It's not like, okay, I'm in with these people and it's all, that's what it is. He describes the Spirit as always moving and flowing. It's like the difference between looking at a map, saying, okay, that's where this is, that's where this is, that's where, and everything's drawn out, and here's the map, and then wayfinding. How many of you guys know what wayfinding is? It's like the ancient Polynesian science and art of sailing and moving on the ocean from island to island. And it's a total act of faith. It's a total art. It's a total dynamic thing. It's not, you don't just look at a map, say that's where this is and that's where this is. Like wayfinding is is you have to be aware of what's going on. You have to look and you have to be, uh, have an awareness, an observation, a reflection, an ability to see things that maybe others don't see. And the wayfinders were taught how to find the way home or their way to the next island and, and what they would do is they would feel the waters and what's the warmth of the water and they'd look at the um at the schools of fish they would look at birds and see their migratory patterns they would look at the stars at night and and all of these things with the uh, with the tides um of the and the way the water would flow they they would find their way forward because they're paying attention to the signs yes i learned some of that from moana not all of it some of you guys I think it's a great illustration. Some people want to be handed a map and, th- and they just want to be in and it's all good. And that's my faith. And then they just, they kind of put their faith on top of their political persuasion, their family persuasion, their personality persuasion. They put all that stuff and they put that kind of on top as a veneer. And that's all that, maybe that's all you've been taught. Faith is dynamic. 
We have to learn to see the Spirit. Are you kidding me? That sounds hard. Like, what if you mess up? Yeah, you will. And you have to learn to be able to walk by faith. Oh, that's, that wasn't the Spirit. You know, that was just my stomach or whatever. Um, some of you guys like, maybe, but can't feelings control? Yeah, that, 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 can, that can happen. But don't make mistakes that a, a static type of faith, a map, just everything's concrete and set in stone type of faith that, that, that has no need to look to the world that God is at work in our world right now. Uh, that, that faith is just as emotionally driven as the other, we just stand a chance to follow the Spirit as we learn. When I talk with ones like my, grand, my grandpa who's walked with God, I would encourage you, if you want to learn how to wayfind in the Spirit, how to have faith in the Spirit and see what God's doing by a Spirit, you, is to seek spiritual, um, spiritual guides, people who have been down the road always. So when I talk with my parents or my grandpa, you know, they, they talk about, man, it's, you just learn to hear their voice you, or hear the Spirit's voice. You learn the way the Spirit has worked in your life and you look for the patterns, you look for the way and you start living by faith and it takes you out of your comfort zone and it takes you out of, uh, of what you thought you were gonna do and you're, you become led by the Spirit. Um, there's a, an author I really like. He's kind of an older author, but he writes, he writes a book on guidance by the Spirit. His name is F.B. Meyer and he talks about, about three things that have really helped him live um, in step with the Spirit, be Spirit-led. And, and the wind of the Spirit happens in his life when he is paying attention to what the Spirit is doing in him. Like when he can sense a sense of calm and peace and joy or angst and what is the Spirit of God and, he, and what is going on in him. And he pays attention to that. He pays attention, what is the Spirit of God doing out in the world? And what are, what's, the, what's the effects of the wind? And can I see what's happening? Am I even looking? And then he says, and then the, the wind of the Spirit that's happened in the Scriptures, what God has already said. And when, when the, the movement of the Spirit in you and around you and within the Scriptures align, and there's alignment there, he's like, you can feel confidence to move forward in faith. You're wayfinding. It's dynamic. It's real. It's your faith. It's not your parents' faith. It's your faith. It's not the faith of, of other people or the church around you. Like it, it, It's our faith, but it's also your faith. And I, I just want to make sure that we, we emphasize that. And the practice, the tool of someone who is spirit-led, following the wind of the spirit, is someone who takes time to reflect. Reflects on what's going on in the world. Reflects on what's going on in the Bible. Reflects on what's going on internally. Reflection is like one of the most, well, I think one of the most um, underutilized, overlooked practices of the spiritual life. Reflection, what is going on in me? What's going on outside of me? What's going on in the scriptures and how does this all line up? Because I'll tell you what, um, Nicodemus, he knew the, the Bible backwards and front, but he had no clue about the spirit he had no clue about how jesus did the things he was doing because he had never been taught to go from static faith to dynamic faith from getting the map to wayfinding and i want that for you reflect reflect slow down slow the gears of your life down and the the enemy of reflection is busyness and hurry the enemy of of, of being able to reflect on what God's doing and following the, the movement of the Spirit, being led by that is, is how busy we are. We are busy minds and, and technology and all the things, all the barriers that like, want to capture our attention and work and stress and, and relational tension and all these things in our lives. And, and we just need to slow down. My son and my, my dog, Whiskey, are always moving around. Like they're always in motion, and sometimes like they're so going so crazy, and they're, they even fight each other. My my son will he start he's starting to bully the dog. He'll like ram him with his head, and I'll just like I'll have to grab them both, and then I'll just hold them, and I'll just be like slow down, I'll, and they'll be squiggling and moving and squirming, and then after a few moments, all of a sudden they settle down, breathing, and they calm, and I set them down, and they're calm for a little while, and then they wind back up and go. <laughs> I feel like God sometimes has to do that reflection. That's, that's like allowing God to kind of hold us and still us and say, what is going on? Amen? All right, let's finish with this. Rivers, being spirit-filled. Rivers, learning to be spirit-filled. It says this, and Jesus said this on the last day of the festival. Jesus stood up and shouted to the crowds, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. 
He went on to say, for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from the heart of anyone who believes in me. The rivers are, are the images of like rivers in the desert uh, of, of our community, rivers in the desert of the world, rivers in the desert of our lives personally. And God wants to create a river through our, our life. He wants to create a river with our church, but it's by the spirit. It's not by our power. It's not by our strength. It's not by our might. It's not by our strength. It's by the power of the spirit. We have to be spirit-immersed people to even see the spirit and, then, and recognize his work. And then we have to become spirit-led. And, and, but sometimes we can get so busy and so spirit-led that we're not spirit-filled. For us to become rivers of life that flow to the world, we have to be filled. Um, I, 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 would, I would come back to verse 37. It says that Jesus said, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Come to me and drink. And that's the image of Israel wandering, the people of Israel wandering in Exodus in the desert, thirsty and not having enough water and then God providing miraculous water for them. You ever been thirsty? God looks at the world and says, man, you guys are so spiritually thirsty. You're just running around. You're so busy. And even those of you who are spirit-led, you're not coming to me to be filled. When was the last time you came to God and said, God, would you fill me? Would you fill me? Would you fill me? For us to be powerful, for us to be persistent, rivers in the desert, we have to be filled by God first and foremost. Uh, in Ephesians 5.18, it says, be filled by the Spirit. It's a command, be filled by the Spirit. In John, 1 John uh, 4, 1, it says, and God has given us His Spirit as proof that we live in Him and He in us, that, that, that we are immersed in God and that He is immersed in us, that we become filled with God's presence. If we want to see God's power, we have to have God's presence in us and in our lives. And when I think about this, I, I think of this illustration. It might seem kind of silly to you, but... Um, but it's something that I needed this week. And maybe some, someone here needs this. So we, we all have this life that we're given. Some of us, maybe today you took a step of faith and you, you have the spirit immersed life. You have the Jesus life in you now. Maybe you've been following him for a long time and, and life gets busy and we fill it with all kinds of things, don't we? We find all kinds of things to fill this cup. And yet it remains dry and, and empty like a desert and and when God comes and we ask him to fill us up or he starts leading us, sometimes he, f- he fills us up a little bit and then we start doing things and we start pouring out into other people or other situations. Or maybe we just have some issues in our own life that are sin issues, disbelief issues, uh, disobedience issues where we, don't, we want to do our thing and not God's thing. Either way, we, we become empty again. And, and, and one of the, the commands of Scripture is to be filled and how are we filled? What does verse 37 say about being filled? Come to me, all of you. Come to me and be filled. I'll give you living water. And there's this idea that we're to be filled up as people. And people who are filled up, uh, when they fill up a church, creates a church that's filled up with the Spirit of God, the power of God. Um, but the beauty is that when we are filled by Him, it's so cool that as we're filled, all of a sudden there's this overflow and God starts pouring out of us and that there's rivers in the desert. But then sometimes we get busy with life again. And we're spirit-led and we go over here, we go over there, we think we might be or we just get distracted. And all of a sudden the water starts draining. We start losing that. We become emptier and emptier. And then what do we do again? We start filling our lives with like what we think will give us um, satisfaction with our work, with relationships, with money. I don't, you know, I don't know what it is for you. And Jesus is always calling us for renewal. Renewal is the spiritual practice of coming to Jesus again and again and again. That just as we get thirsty after drinking, we play a hard game of whatever. We, we're watching kids and we've got life. We always got to be drinking. We always got to stay hydrated. And there's so many dehydrated Christians walking around. And the practice of renewal is coming again and again to Jesus and letting him fill us up. And I want the image of what happens when we're full and the rivers coming forth to be the image that we leave with today. Be thinking about this. Isn't it amazing that Jesus says, come and I will fill you up. And just a little bit of the water of Christ pouring into us uh, is incommensurate with the rivers that come out of us. 
So like a little bit of this pouring in of Jesus, this practice of renewal, whether it's in time in the word or time where you're thinking about God, turning your energies and your thoughts and your hearts to God. God, fill me. Bring your presence into my life. And there's a desire for him. And when we come together here on Sundays when we worship, my hope is that, that you're asking God, would you fill me? Would you renew me? Would you, would you fill me up with, uh, with a new energy, a new hope, a new vision, uh, just a newness? I need your life over and over again, this practice of renewal and that's how rivers in the desert happen and I want to have my life look like that where I am filled by Jesus but then the little bit that he puts in becomes a whole lot that comes out of my life and when people look at George they're like they're not like wow look at him they're like how does he do those things that he does how does God you how does how does that happen in his life the only answer could be that there's a spirit beyond me that is filling me and flowing out of my life A life filled with the Spirit becomes a life flowing with the Spirit. A church filled with the Spirit becomes a life flowing of the Spirit. I would love our, our, our area to see Whitewater and just look at us and be like, how does a church of that size with those kind of people have the kind of impact it has? And we'd know the answer. What's the answer? We're filled with the Spirit. Water, wind, and rivers. Be immersed in the life of the Spirit. If you don't know Jesus, be, learn to be immersed. Invite Him in. Then learn to be Spirit-led. Go where the Spirit leads. Learn to reflect and be aware. And then finally, be filled so that the Spirit can flow. That's my prayer for, you, for us. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We're so grateful for you. I pray that we would have just more and more stories like Jory where there's rivers in the desert. And Lord, we just recognize right now we cannot do this on our own. Many of us, we know that as parents, we can't be good parents on our own. We can't uh, figure out our lives out on our own. We can't make the wise decisions we need to on our own. We need you, God. Would you fill us again and again, not a one-time filling, over and over, God. We, we want to be a people that are always on our knees begging you, Lord. We need you. Would you fill our hearts so that you can flow to the world that is dry and weary and in need of life. We want Pierce County to flourish because Jesus is flowing into this town and into this area. Lord, we pray for this. We ask for this, but we know that we need your spirit. Lord, we, we ask, would you make us a spirit-empowered people? In Jesus' name, amen.